Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction offer. Um, and thanks a lot for the invitation to speak here. It's a great pleasure and, in fact, a great honor for me to be speaking uh, at this conference with Luke. Um, so Luke's work has influenced a lot of my own work uh, throughout my career. Um, and in fact, my very first uh, kind of foray into piatic Hodge theory was about piatic dry drum cohomology, which is essentially uh, an object that Luke invented in his thesis. Uh, and over the years, he has sort of been extremely kind and encouraging and generous uh, with sharing his ideas and uh, sometimes attributing things to me that not necessarily were due to me. Um, and in fact, even during the pandemic, he's been, uh, we had sort of very uh, nice email exchanges where he would check in and we would discuss not only mathematics, but also uh, he would ask about the state of the virus in Michigan, and he would be slightly worried about the state here while I'm much more worried about the what's going on in Paris. Um, so it's been really nice. Uh, thank you, Luke. Um, okay, so today I wanna to talk about uh, the absolute prismatic site. Uh, so what I'm discussing is uh, joint work. It's a, it's a pair of papers uh, joined in progress, one with Jacob Lurie and one with Peter Schulze. And uh, it will also uh, cover some work of Drinfeld, uh, which was done independently and it's already on the archive. Um, and I'll be more precise when I, uh, when I get to the objects. Yeah, so the absolute prismatic site, what is it about? Um, so this prismatic theory was invented a few years ago uh, in my work with Peter. And it was sort of, it's been quite useful in understanding geometric cohomology theories. So in situations like you have a smooth proper variety say over uh, OCP um, and you wanna wow. compare various cohomology theories attached to it. And uh, you can do, this prismatic theory gives you a tool for doing that. Uh, what I want to discuss today is the absolute version of the theory. So this is similar to the distinction between uh, etal cohomology of algebraic varieties over an algebraic closed field versus absolute etal cohomology. So something that uh, talks to Galois cohomology. Um, so that's the plan. Okay, so let me begin by just recalling very quickly what the notion of a prism is. I suspect this showed up in each house talk, but I couldn't attend it and the video wasn't up yesterday. So I'm not 100% sure what happened. Um, I just need to, well, I'll give the definition anyways. Um, so a, a prism is a pair. A comma I, where sort of A is a, is a commutative ring with the delta structure. And so a delta structure um, is essentially the same thing as a derived lift of the Frobenius. So if the ring is P torsion free, it's literally just the same thing as a lift of the Frobenius mod P. Uh, and if it's not P torsion free, uh, then it's slightly more information. It sort of remembers why um, this given endomorphism is a lift of the Frobenius rather than just the fact that it is. Um, and I is a ideal in A, which gives a Cartier divisor. So it's locally generated by a non-zero divisor. And they're supposed to interact in some way. Uh, and so the interaction is, is the following, whoops. Such that uh, there are two conditions are satisfied. So the first one is kind of a mild completeness condition. So it says that A is, uh, I'll put it in brackets derived, P comma I complete. So uh, P and all elements uh, of I are topologically no potent. And this derived notion of completeness is a weakening of the usual notion of completeness. So it's just more useful in working with non-Noetherian objects. Um, and the crucial condition is the prismatic condition. So it says that any local generator of the ideal uh, satisfies the following condition. So if you hit it, if you hit this generator with the Frobenius uh, that is part of the delta structure, then you know that it looks like D to the P plus P times something, because it's a lift of the Frobenius mod P, but you require that the something is a unit. Um, and so if you like, this is saying that the first derivative of D in the P direction uh, is a unit. Um, and this definition, uh, it doesn't literally parse because I set things in terms of local generators, but maybe uh, more sort of global 
way of saying this is that P belongs to the ideal generated by I and pi of I. So this is kind of a purely uh, intrinsic uh, way of saying if it doesn't require choosing a generator. But in, all, in practice, uh, this is sort of the useful way of thinking about it. OK, so th these are prisms. Uh, and then there are some examples uh, that I should mention. Uh, I, will, I will not spend too much time on this. So the condition should be uh, a priori in terms of delta of d being a unit. Right, the condition is that delta of d is a unit, but that's equivalent yeah, but to saying. When you write that p is in i plus phi i, you, you, you have still to divide by p to get the, the delta is a unit. So in general, p is a zero divisor. So no, it doesn't p. matter. Uh, the condition I wrote is equivalent to the condition that delta of d is a unit, even, ah, okay. if, p is a, even if p is a zero divisor. OK. It's a topological condition. So somehow checking something as a unit can be checked after modding out by topologically nilpotent things. And that's good enough uh, to prove this equivalence. OK, so the examples are uh, the following. So the most basic example of a, so elements uh, d with this property uh, are called distinguished elements. Uh, and so the most basic example of a distinguished element uh, is, a, is p, the prime number p itself. So let's say a is the width vectors of k, where k is a perfect field of Kersey p, or perfect ring, actually. Uh, and the ideal is generated by p. And in this case, I don't need to specify the delta structure because there's a unique delta structure. Uh, the width vectors of a perfect field of Kersey p has a unique lift of the Frobenius. Um, and it's easy to see that, okay, so if I, if I take this definition of uh, what a prism is, then this condition is obvious that the ideal P satisfies this. Uh, but also with this definition, it's kind of clear because if you hit uh, P with the Frobenius, here you get a P, but here you'll get a P to the P. So the difference is P times a unit. Um, and so these are crystalline prisms because uh, they, they correspond in this prismatic theory to crystalline cohomology. And I think uh, Arthur talked about these in his talk. Um, at, at sort of the opposite extreme, there are these so-called Broekissen prisms, which will show up uh, in my talk later today. Uh, so these showed up in the classification of crystalline Galois representations. Uh, and I will just sort of write down one example. So take A to be ZP power series U. Um, so one variable uh, formal power series over uh, ZP. Uh, phi is uniquely specified by what it does to U. And I just send U to U to the P. Um, and then the ideal uh, is going to be the ideal generated by an Eisenstein polynomial. So an example would be something like u minus p, or u to the p minus p. Uh, but all, of course, you can do any other Eisenstein polynomial. So in, this, in these cases, a mod i is the ring of integers of a local field. Uh, and that's going to be how these will show up for us later. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to check this condition here, the prismatic condition. Um, and maybe I should point out, so the difference between these two examples uh, is the following. So in example one, P equals I, whereas in example two, uh, P comma I form a regular sequence of length two. Uh, and so it, I'll, I'll try to come back to this later. This somehow corresponds to a certain flatness condition on a morphism. And then maybe the third example I should mention uh, is the example of perfect prisms. So here I will just formulate it as an equivalent. So if I work with uh, prisms a comma i, uh, such that a mod i is perfect, uh, a mod p is perfect. And these are actually turn out to be equivalent to perfectoid rings. And the functor is just a comma i goes to a mod i. So in the special case where i equals p, this is the equivalence between uh, perfect rings of Kersic p and I think what are called strict p rings. Uh, but it's a general statement about all perfectoid rings. Uh, and so the example actually that will be relevant for us is that uh, OCP, uh, the ring of integers of uh, the completion of the algebraic closure of QP on this side uh, is a perfectoid ring. And that corresponds uh, via this equivalence to Fontaine's a nth construction. Okay, and then there are a few other examples one could also mention, like the Q de Ram prism uh, and so on. But let me let me not uh, write them down. So, so these are what prisms are, and in 
earlier work, we studied this relative prismatic theory, which uh, where you fix a base prism A comma I that you work over, and you have some geometric object that lives over A mod I, and then you try to sort of probe it using further prisms. Uh, and what I want to discuss today is the absolute version, so I don't fix a base. Uh, so look, here's the definition that we want to study. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so the setup is going to be as follows. So X is going to be a p-adic formal scheme. In fact, for sort of for most of the for most of my talk, it'll end up being something like ZP or the ring of integers of a local field. Um, and then it's prism absolute prismatic site, which I will denote by X prism is the following object. So it's the category of all pairs A comma I uh, consisting of prisms uh, together with a map from spoof of A mod I into X. So it's a prism over X uh, is what I would refer to this object as. Um, when I say spoof of A mod I, uh, this means I give it the p adic topology. In general, if you're working over a prism A comma I, you always give it the P comma I adic topology. And so that determines topologies in the quotients as well. And so this is what I call the absolute prismatic site um, of X. And we wanna try and understand it better in this talk. Uh, so I guess so far I've only told you what the category is. Uh, I didn't tell you what the topology is. So it's topologized um, via say the Zariski topology. on A mod I. So the, for what I'm gonna talk about, the topology does plays no role. So you can replace the risky with your favorite kind of topology on prisms. So like the Etal topology or even the flat topology, which is useful in making various arguments. Um, and there are certain obvious sheaves on this, which I wanna give names to. So. If I take a comma i, an object of the site, I can send it to the following. I can either send it to a, oh, let me write it like this. Um, I can send it to a, I can send it to i, I can send it to a mod i. And all of these guys give you sheaves. So this one is called o prism, the first one. The next one is called i prism. And the last one is called o prism bar, which is also just o prism mod i prism. So do you do you work also with the boundedness condition sometimes? Ah, yeah, sorry, I should probably yeah. impose boundedness here. Thank you. Otherwise, you have to derive things more, yeah. OK, so for example, right, like with this definition, if I just take x equals zp, uh, then this is like this part of the data is just extraneous. And so this is literally just the category of all prisms, bounded prisms. Okay, and so the goals of, goal of this talk is the following. So there are two goals. A brief question. Yep. In, in, in earlier manuscripts, it, it, you say that I is in all cases known to be principal. Is that could it be true in this context as well or not? Uh, so I don't think it's literally true. Like there are examples where it's not true, uh, but they well, never sure, but... come up. Um, okay, that, that's really what I meant. Yeah. In, in that case, uh, the, the, the situation between A and I is not that important, those two sheaves. No, no, it's very important because there's a Frobenius that I, I guess, there's okay. a Frobenius acting on this guy. Okay. Yeah. But also there's, even if there is a generator, there's no canonical generator. So I don't think like you can say as, as like sheaves, they're isomorphic. Um, okay, so the goal is the following. So first I want to describe um, quasi-coherent sheaves or really uh, crystals, I guess. crystals of quasi-coherent sheaves on the site X prism. Well, actually I'll just do the ZP case uh, today. So a spoof ZP prism O prism. Um, and so this is the part that's joined with Jacob um, and also independently due to Drinfeld. So we're gonna do this uh, via stacky approach. And the stacky approach, it, it, it tends to clarify certain questions that are sort of hard to understand otherwise. So like a natural question you might ask is, uh, 
what is the cohomological dimension of the absolute prismatic side of the scheme, for example, even for spuff ZP itself. And this is not clear from the definitions, but I will explain why it's one uh, using the stacky approach later in this talk. Uh, and so this part of the talk will be slightly sort of derived in the sense that there are no conditions I'm imposing on the sheaves. Uh, in fact, everything I say will work in the derived category. So I'll, you'll get sort of a reasonable understanding of the derived category of quasi-coherent sheaves or, or crystals of quasi-coherent sheaves. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I want to turn on the Frobenius. So I want to talk about um, describing F crystals. So crystals with a Frobenius structure, but this will only be a vector bundles. And this will be in the case of spuff OK prism, where K over QP is a finite extension. And so this is the part that's joined with uh, Schultz. Here, uh, we obtain a description uh, in terms of crystalline Galois representations. Uh, and so our motivation for this uh, was that it's not so clear what a good notion of a mod P crystalline Galois representation is. But if you have a description through the site, uh, it gives you at least a candidate definition. Um, and so th uh, that's the plan of the talk. Uh, are there any questions so far? So I apologize, I'm not gonna be able to follow the chat in real time. So if there's a question in the chat or in the Q and A, someone please ask me. Uh, okay, so let me discuss uh, the absolute prismatic site via stacks, oops. And so where do the stacks come in? So let me sort of first motivate it verbally. Um, so over the complex numbers, you can ask, uh, there's a similar picture. So given any algebraic variety over the complex numbers, you, you can talk about a Durham cohomology, or you can talk about the notion of vector bundles with back connection, which are sort of coefficients objects for Durham cohomology. Uh, and then you can ask the question whether or not there is another geometric object associated to X with the property that vector bundles with flat connection on X are just vector bundles on this other geometric object. And Durham cohomology of X is just O cohomology of this other object. Uh, it turns out the answer is yes. So Sim Carlos Simpson uh, has this notion of the Durham space attached to any variety and it satisfies these two properties. So it allows you to translate questions of Durham cohomology and coefficients to just questions of uh, vector bundles and their cohomology, but on some more exotic object. And that's why the kind is, of thing- why, why, why does the infinitesimal site itself do that? Well, the infinitesimal side is not a geometric object in the sense that it's not like a variety or a stack. I want like a variety or a stack to which I can apply methods of algebraic geometry. Not a stack? Well, I mean, it's a site. I, I want like, you know, something that's a functor from rings to sets or whatever. Yeah. I'll explain better. Okay. So what, I what I'm really looking for is some kind of a geometric object, so like an algebraic stack or something close enough to an algebraic stack with the property that quasi-coherent sheaves on the stack correspond to uh, crystals of quasi-coherent sheaves on my prismatic site. Uh, and it turns out the following definition works. So Drinfeld uh, arrived at this independently. Uh, so maybe I guess I should wait. So this is joined with Lurie, uh, but also independently by Drinfeld. And our motivations were somewhat different. Uh, so I think um, for Jacob and I, at least for me, uh, one of the motivations for finding the stacky approach was to just better understand questions of uh, absolute prismatic cohomology, like the one I mentioned before, what is the cohomological dimension? Um, and so here's, uh, here's what works. So we call this the Cartier-Witt stack. So it's gonna be a formal stack or, uh, so W cart is our notation for it. Um, it's a formal stack. So it's a functor from P nilpotent rings uh, to groupoids. If you like, it's a category fiber in groupoids, but I'm just gonna write it down as a functor. Um, and I'll just tell you what the definition is. So W cart evaluated on a P nilpotent ring R uh, is, uh, so I'll first sort of say how you think about it and then give you a formal definition. So it's a derived prism structure on W of R. And so what the derived part here means that if you go back to the definition of a prism uh, over here, 
uh, I had this condition that I was an ideal of A. Uh, so that's like saying it's an effective Cartier divisor. But in classical algebraic geometry, there's this weakening of the notion of an effective Cartier divisor, which is a virtue of Cartier divisor. So it's just, a, it's not gonna be an inclusion anymore. It's just a map from an invertible module to A. And that's the kind of thing we are demanding over here. And so one can say it extremely concretely. Uh, and so let me try to do that. So very explicitly what this means is the following. Okay. So a finial potent ring is a is a non-unital ring or it is a unital ring? Unital. So just some power ah, of p is zero. Ah, okay. I thought you meant uh, uh, the okay, something like those formal groups. So, okay. No, 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 just like some power of p is zero in my ring. So it's a, okay. it's going to be like a p-adic formal stack. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm going to give an explicit description of the stack as a quotient. So the numerator is going to be the functor of distinguished elements. So W card zero uh, is the set of all bit vectors, A zero, A one, dot, 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 and W of R, the two conditions. So A zero is no potent and A one is a unit. So this is exactly what a distinguished element in the bit vectors looks like. Uh, so if you like, this is the set of all distinguished elements in W of R. And then W card is the quotient of W card zero by a group action, by the obvious group action, W star. So this is an explicit formula for what uh, W card looks like. Um, okay, and so the claim I wanna make is that understanding the stack uh, W card uh, is pretty close to understanding uh, the absolute prismatic side of ZP. And you can translate various notions back and forth. Um, and so I would like to explain that next. So let's try to understand the geometry of the stack slightly better. So let me first uh, tell you what the what the points are. So is, is there a topology here? Uh, yeah, so I'm implicitly actually using the flat topology, right, thank you. Okay, and, and this quotient means in, in the sense of sheaves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in, right, as, as groupoids, it's a quotient uh, of a, of an infinite dimensional affine scheme by this group action. Or infinite dimensional formal affine scheme by a group action. Um, right, so let's first understand the points of the stack. Um, and so it's a stack on P null potent ring. So the physical stack underlying it just lives in characteristic P. So I just need to understand its functor of points on rings of characteristic P. And really just the points there. So I just need to evaluate it on fields of characteristic P. And I might as well take it to be perfect. And so there it turns out it has only one point. So, oops. For any perfect field K of characteristic P, uh, this groupoid W card of K is reduced to a one element set. So that element is given by the prism structure given by a crystalline prism. Or if you like, is the distinguished element uh, P in the bed vectors. And the claim is that that's the unique point and it has no automorphisms. So as a the underlying physical point set of the stack is just one point. Uh, and so if it was an actual algebraic stack, then you would know at this point that it's the classifying stack of its automorphism group at this point. But it's not an algebraic stack, it's only a formal stack. Uh, and so it's not actually the classifying stack of any group. Uh, I mean, this sort of phenomenon already shows up with something like A1 hat. So if you take A1 and complete it at the origin, it's a formal stack with only one point, but obviously it's not the classifying stack of a group. Um, but it's not that far. So. Um, so let me just say over here that for only one physical point. So I'll come back to this, how far it is from being a uh, one point stack in a moment, but I wanna first explain the connection to prisms. So how does it connect to a prism structure? Well, I mean, it's sort of clear that it should connect because it has to do with dry prism structures. But you can make it very explicit. So given any prism, A comma I, there's a natural map. From, so I'll call it rho sub A comma I, from spoof of A to W card. And I'll just say verbally how you construct this map. Uh, it's basically because the ring A has a delta structure. So there's a natural map from A to its width vectors. 
And so using that map from A to its width vectors, you can take this prism structure on A and move it over to get a prism structure on W of A. And that by definition of points of the stack gives you such a map. Um, and so every prism has a natural map to W card and this map, the, the collection of all of these maps approximates W card in a really nice way. So here's a sort of fact, oops, which is if you try to understand quasi coherent sheaves on W card, uh, first of all, they map to the inverse limit of, so for each prism A comma I, I can pull back along this map, uh, row AI and get an object uh, in the right category of A. Uh, the objects I get because of the way my topology is set up are gonna be P comma I complete. So maybe I'll write that properly. Um, D P comma I complete objects on A. And it turns out that this is actually an equivalence. So understanding quasi-coherent sheaves on the stack is the same as understanding crystals of quasi-coherent sheaves on uh, the absolute prismatic side of ZP. So I mean, I would define this to be the crystals quasi-coherent of split ZP prism or prism. So I and believe so, that the, the limit is some kind of homotopy. Limit yeah, this is, a, this is happening in infinity categories. Thanks, yeah. Uh, okay, but then the, what is the actual definition of DQC? Does it have a definition direct, not with infinity category, just as a usual? So the, can you say can you say what is DQC, or does it require something very? Well, I mean, I'll say it in infinity categories, but I think you can just give a direct definition. Uh, with, and infinity categories, whenever you have this functor, uh, it's quasi-coherent sheaves on the functor are going to be the inverse limit of quasi-coherent sheaves over all maps from spec R into the functor. So it's the inverse limit of R modules for every map from spec R into the functor. And then the assertion I'm making here is that a much smaller collection of maps suffices to compute that inverse limit. Uh, ah, because you want, uh, uh, ah, okay. Right, like if you have a stack, uh, you can define, you can take the definition, you just take a variety. You can take the definition I give. You look at all maps from affine schemes into your variety. You look at quasi coherent sheaves on the affine variety and then you take that ginormous inverse limit. That's the definition. Mm -hmm. And then Zariski descent for quasi coherent sheaves will tell you that you can actually compute it using uh, like a single Zariski cover rather than this kind of ginormous inverse limit. Well, okay, so if you just take the site of affine objects, uh, mm -hmm. mapping to the stack with a suitable topology like Zariski et al, mm -hmm. flat or something, and then you consider just uh, uh, shifts of a ring size in the, in the, in the old sense without, and uh, consider the unbounded, I suppose, the right category mm -hmm. of this. Is, th is this exactly what you consider or there is some? Yes. Something no, I think is that's exactly, exactly what I consider. Uh, okay. So you can just say it is the, uh, okay. Yeah. And so, Right, so what this tells you is that if you wanna specify, well, th there's two points. Uh, so one is that I wanted to understand crystals geometrically in terms of quasi-coherent sheaves on some single object and this accomplishes that. But what it also tells you is that if you wanna produce quasi-coherent sheaves over here, there's a recipe for doing that, which is I need to produce for every prism A comma I, an object of this uh, dry category of A with suitable completeness. And this assignment should be compatible with base change. And so we'll see that geometry over uh, spec ZP will give you, like every time you have a geometric object over spec ZPs, uh, it's cohomology will give you an example of such a, uh, of such a sheep. Um, so I'll come back to that in a moment, but I wanna first describe uh, more about the structure of the stack. So there's an interesting divisor in the stack, uh, which is one of the main tools for understanding it. So this is the Hodge state stack. Uh, so in, in relative prismatic cohomology, uh, passing to, like, if you want to understand relative prismatic cohomology, understanding hot state cohomology, which is what happens when you mod out by the ideal, is like one of the most important tools. And something similar happens in this kind of stacky context. So the basic point is that you can sort of, taking the zeroth component, so I guess let me just say it this way. We have a fiber diagram, which looks like so. So here's W card. Uh, I claim that it has a natural map to A1 hat mod GM. And this is simply by taking the zeroth component of the width vector in the presentation that I gave earlier. But my condition, my definition of W card over here had this, 
I had this quotient description and in the numerator, the condition on the bit vector was that the zeroth component uh, is nilpotent. And so take, forgetting everything else gives me a map to A1 hat. And then when I quotient out by the group actions, I get a map to A1 hat mod GM. Uh, and inside here, I have this sort of natural divisor, which is given by the origin, which is BGM. So I'll call it zero. And the fiber product is defined to be the hot state locus. So this is the definition. Uh, this is the hot state stack. Um, and so I said earlier the W card was not an algebraic stack because it has this formal direction coming from the first, exactly this uh, zeroth component being uh, only topologically nilpotent. Uh, but when you pass to BGM, you sort of you gotten rid of this formal direction, and so now it has a good chance of being an algebraic stack or p-adic uh, formal stack. So there's no i-adic topology anymore, and that turns out to actually be true. In fact, we can describe this stack super explicitly. It's just the classifying stack of a certain group, and so let me record this as a lemma. So there's a natural map. So the map from spuf ZP to W card hosh state, uh, there's a natural map like this given by the bit vector V of one. So V of one is a distinguished element uh, in the bit vectors of ZP. Uh, and so it gives me a map from spuf ZP to W card and V of one by definition has the property that the zeroth component is zero because it's the verschiebung of something else. And so really it's, it's factoring through the hot state locus because uh, this, this condition over here is uh, imposing um, the condition that the zero component is zero. And so it gives you a map like so, and it turns out that this map uh, is surjective uh, and the automorphism group is understandable. So it induces an equivalence between um, the classifying stack of the Trebanius kernel on W star and W star hot state, uh, W card hot state. So the hot state locus is, has this very uh, relatively simple uh, geometric description. It's the classifying stack of this group scheme, which is the kernel on Frobenius on the multiplicative bit vectors. And so I wanted to prove it, but given how I'm doing on time, maybe I'm not gonna prove this. Um, it's, it's, it's a pleasant exercise in uh, first, so the surjectivity part of this assertion is essentially after you unwind all the definitions, that's the fact that Frobenius and the bit vectors is a surjective uh, map of functors in the flat topology. And then understanding what the automorphism group is, uh, is also an extremely simple calculation with bit vectors. So I can give it later if someone uh, is interested, but let me avoid doing that now. Um, okay, so what's the upshot of all of this? The upshot of all of this is that, okay, you have this W card, which is fibered over A1 hat mod GM. Over this kind of divisor, uh, zero, I get the hosh state stack. And the hosh state stack is this classifying stack. Uh, the reason this is useful is that quasi-coherent sheaves on this classifying stack are extremely easy to understand. Um, so the group scheme is slightly weird, but sort of its Cartier dual is nice. And that means that quasi-coherent sheaves on the classifying stack are also nice. And so here's kind of a concrete corollary you get out of this, which is a connection. So I'll call this Sen theory, because uh, it's a connection to the Sen operator in Piatic hosh theory. So we get the following explicit description of what quasi-coherent sheaves look like. Um, so quasi-coherent sheaves on W card hosh state identifies with uh, what we call sand complexes, which are just uh, representations of this group scheme, but uh, we can make it super explicit. So it's the following object. Uh, it's all uh, objects E in the P complete derived category of uh, ZP adjoin a formal variable. So I'll call the formal variable theta. Theta is the sen operator. Uh, and this, uh, these objects have to satisfy a condition. And so the condition is that the theta action on E mod P uh, has generalized eigenvalues uh, in the ground field. So I'm asserting that there is a generalized eigenspace decomposition and all those generalized eigenvalues are just concentrated at the points of FP uh, sitting inside A1 of FP. Okay, and so this is a pretty reasonable uh, linear algebra condition. And so 
therefore, this category is pretty easy to understand. In particular, you can understand things like X uh, in this category. Uh, and, well, can, can I can I ask a question? Maybe it's not quite the right time, but uh -huh. you missed chance talk. But but it seems to me these should correspond in some sense to crystals of O-bar modules, in your in your yeah. Original... So these are going to be crystals of O-bar modules and spoof ZP. Right, but but uh, chance talk explained at least in the relative setting that crystals of O-bar modules correspond to Higgs fields, more precisely uh -huh. quasi nilpotent Higgs fields. Your theta looks sort of like a quasi nil looks. Yeah, like... so I like to think of theta as some kind of an arithmetic Higgs field. I mean, if right. there was some say... non-existence base called F one, then this would be kind of the Higgs field on spec ZP over spec F one. But the, but the quasi nilpotent means that this looks more like a quasi unipotent condition rather than a quasi nilpotent condition because the eigenvalues are are not zero but in FP. I'm a little well, they, there that. could be eigenvalue zero. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's not for, quite for nil potent, it's slightly, slightly bigger than that. For him, they have to be. So I'm wondering uh -huh. what... Well, I don't... Okay. No, and I think this is, is kind of the interesting part, actually, that in the absolute theory, you don't see as much unipotence as you see in the relative theory. And that, okay. I'm, I'm going to explain why this buys you a lot. So this has some okay. mileage. Um, okay. Right, so the reason I call this uh, Sen theory is that... Um, Absolute prismatic cohomology uh, of schemes over ZP produces objects on the stack. And uh, for those objects, uh, this, uh, this operator uh, exactly is the Sen operator from Piatic Hodge theory, which gives you the Hodge state decomposition after inverting P. Uh, and so I'll try to sort of make this more precise uh, uh, now. Um, yeah, maybe one thing I should say before I actually say that is just so that if you concentrate at this, uh, at this part, this means that any object in this category has a, has a Z mod P grading. I can grade it by the generalized eigenvalues mod p. And so every object in here having a z mod p grading is actually very easy to understand in terms of this picture, because this group scheme has a mu p inside it. Uh, w star of f has the kernel of uh, Frobenius on GM inside it. And so any representation of w star of f in particular gives you a representation of mu p, and that corresponds to a z mod p grading, which in this picture is the grading by generalized eigenvalues. OK. So let me now talk about the absolute prismatic cohomology uh, and how, why it gives you, uh, why you can use this uh, description to study it. Okay, so let's say uh, X over ZP is a smooth formal scheme, smooth piatic formal scheme of relative dimension D. Um, and so attached to this object, I'm going to define a quasi-coherent sheaf on the Cartier-Witt stack. So I'm going to do it as follows. So I'll, I'll call it H prism of X. Uh, it's the following collection of things. So for every prism A comma I, I'm going to define a module. Uh, and the module is just the relative prismatic cohomology of X over that prism. So I take X, I extend scalars uh, from ZP to A mod I, and then I look at its relative prismatic cohomology over A. Um, and so the collection of all the relative prismatic homology groups attached to X over varying prisms uh, is base change compatible by the Hodge state comparison. And so this defines an object of this category that I had before, the inverse limit over all prisms of a suitably completed derived category of A. And that I told you earlier was the uh, quasi-coherent sheaves on the cartier bit stack. And so this is the prismatic, uh, if you like, this is the push forward of the prismatic structure sheet from uh, the prismatic side uh, stack attached to X to the prismatic stack attached to ZP. Um, I'm not talking about the relative prismatic stack here, so let me just say it this way. And so this satisfies a bunch of nice properties. So this is a definite. X. It's not proper. It's X not proper. Not, but it is quasi compact and quasi separated. Or... Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, sorry. Because Thank you. You, you want uh, to be the smooth. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so. We have the following, uh, this has the following features. Uh, so first is that there's an absolute comparison, meaning if I take global sections of the sheaf, I just get the absolute prismatic homology of X. So it's factoring the process of taking absolute prismatic homology into two steps. Uh, I mean, so if you like, it's just a Luray spectral sequence uh, for uh, the map from X to spec ZP. But this is useful for us because we understand something about the stack. Right, so we understand that the Hodge state locus, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to say this, right. It, one thing that follows from this, maybe I said it verbally, but I didn't write uh, from Sen theory, is that uh, W card has cohomological dimension one, quasi coherent cohomological dimension one.
Um, and so, sorry, I should have said this earlier. So the hush state locus, because it's described by this linear algebra conditions, it's easy to see that it has cohomological dimension one. And uh, W card is some kind of a deformation of W uh, card hush state by one parameter. And so this, this, this condition of having cohomological dimension one survives the deformation. And so you can make some limit argument to go from uh, knowing something about the cohomological dimension of the hush state locus to knowing something about the cohomological dimension of the whole stack. And so going back to this absolute prismatic story, this is very useful because we know that this stack has cohomological dimension one and this object is defined using volatile prismatic theory. So we understand it pretty well. And so an upshot of this is that the absolute prismatic cohomology of X has dimension at most, cohomological dimension at most T plus one. Uh, and so this kind of makes precise uh, this intuition uh, that if something, if something had relative dimension over D, it sort of has absolute dimension D plus one over some uh, non-existent base. Um, so, it, yeah. Is it, is it two, X is half fine? Or is it two D plus one? Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. X is half fine here, yeah. Okay. Right, otherwise uh, the coherent cohomological dimension of X would also have to be accounted for. Um, the other thing I wanted to record is the Durham comparison. And this is just straightforward from the relative theory, but it's necessary to say for what I want to say next. Uh, and so I have this quasi-coherent sheaf on this Karchevitz stack. I told you that the Karchevitz stack has one physical point of characteristic P. And so you can ask what you get when you pull back the sheaf to that physical point. Uh, and you get exactly the Durham cohomology of the special fiber. So pull back along the unique physical point. Uh, uh, actually, the, uh, this uh, isomorphism uh, uh, absolute comparison, it, does it hold only in the Afan case or more generally? It's only maybe the cohomological dimension. Yes, yes. The, this, the affineness is only relevant for, for this part. Affine, but uh, the first part, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. The first part holds there generally, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, so if I pull back along the physical point, what do I get? So X FP upper star of this uh, prismatic uh, complex of X is just the Durham cohomology of the special fiber. Um, and so here for the experts, I wanna point out that um, if I'm, this is why I chose to work over ZP rather than a general unramified base. Uh, there would be a Frobenius, there's a Frobenius twist involved in the Durham comparison. Uh, which I can ignore if I work over ZP. So that's why I did that. Um, okay, so we have this, this sheaf. Uh, it's, uh, its value of the unique physical point is given by Durham cohomology. Uh, but we all can also do something else. We can pull it back to the Hodge state locus, which is uh, something we understand now. So we have the following Hodge state send comparison. So it says the following. So the object that you get by, I take H prism of X, I restrict it to the Hodge state locus. So this is now a quasi coherent sheaf on the Hodge state locus. But this I described earlier in terms of these send complexes. And so you can ask, what is the send complex that you get? And it turns out you can describe it pretty nicely. So first of all, Ignoring the send theory, uh, the, in the relative prismatic case, there is this kind of natural filtration on relative, on relative Hodge state cohomology called the Hodge state, the conjugate filtration. And so you still have that over here. So the object has a natural increasing uh, filtration with GER I given by differential forms. Uh, shifted by minus i. So it's a it's a it's an integral lift of the conjugate filtration under Ram cohomology in Kirsik P. Uh, that's just formally coming out of the relative theory. Uh, but now you can ask how does this interact with the send structure? So how does this interact with the send operator? Uh, and so it turns out it interacts rather nicely. So moreover, oops. The send operator theta I'm sorry, do you have the smoothness assumption here for yeah, the, yeah. And all of for this the assumption assuming. C? Yeah, and all of this I'm assuming X is smooth over ZP, right? If you don't assume smoothness, you can say okay, something similar you. with the cotangent. And can I ask for 
briefly? Yeah. Ah, okay. Can, can I ask briefly for B here? No, for A, I think, for the um, cohomological dimension, do mm -hmm. you have a sort of um, Rorschach cell spectral sequence which relates uh, the absolute cohomology to uh, some group action on the uh, relative cohomology? It's not quite a group action. Um, so it's like, it's related oh, some, to the fact something that- Something of this kind, yeah. Yeah, so this is not quite a group quotient. And so it's not gonna be a group action, but it, there is a description of this in terms of group quotients. It just, it's slightly uh, more involved than what I wanna say right now. I can answer this later if you want. So there is like a natural group quotient that maps to W card, and then you have to modify it along a certain locus. And so that gives you like a spectral sequence to compute what happens over the group quotient. And then also then a fiber diagram to compute what happens when you modify. Okay, so, thank you very much. And sorry mm -hmm. for the interruption. No, no, it's fine. I love the questions. Um, right, but the point I was making is that the send operator theta acts, oops, it acts on GER i by minus i. And this is also, again, something that should be familiar from piatic Hodge theory. Like if, if everything was torsion free, uh, then this is what happens in the Hodge state decomposition. The center operator is the operator that picks out the Hodge state decomposition precisely because it's acting on I forms with uh, weight minus I. And so when you invert P, uh, things split apart completely. But now the nice thing is that everything is happening integrally, um, right? I mean, this was an integral statement uh, and this was also an integral statement. So I can combine B and C. And what happens if you combine B and C is that you get a decomposition for Durham cohomology or rather you get an operator on Durham cohomology. And so here's the corollary of all of this. So this is, uh, this is noticed by Drinfeld. Um, and it says that in the above setup, uh, there is a natural operator theta on the drum cohomology of the special fiber that preserves the conjugate filtration And acts by gur i, uh, acts by minus i on gur i. This is simply because the conjugate filtration is the mod p reduction of the Hodge state filtration. So I have this natural filtration integrally that's preserved by theta. And so I can reduce the picture mod p and still get the conjugate filtration being preserved by theta. And I can, on the other hand, identify the total complex with the Durham cohomology of the special fiber. And so you get this kind of nice. Uh, a nice operator that acts on everything. And so in particular, if the dimension is small, so if the relative dimension is less than or equal to P minus one, uh, all the eigenvalues that show up are distinct. Uh, they don't interact with each other because the integers from zero through P minus one are distinct mod P. Uh, we get the Delini-Luzzi decomposition. But in the linear Lucy, you need only to leave small p square. Yeah, I'll come back to this in a moment. Thank you. Yes, and uh, also I think you you get a grading in any case. You you get right. You grading. always get a grading. Yeah. So okay, I was going to make exactly no, those two no comments. Restriction of dimension. Uh, <laughs> you, you you get the zero p grading. So uh, uh -huh. and also as Oka said, maybe uh, later you will discuss improvements. Right, so all I want to say is exactly the things you guys said. So first of all, uh, this tells you that you get a Z mod P grading because I can just look at the distinct eigenvalues mod P and that gives me a Z mod P grading without any assumptions on the relative dimension. Uh, and then the second thing was that as Ofer said, um, in delaney Z, you only assume there's a lift mod P squared rather than all the way to ZP. And so you can refine everything I've said to work in that setting. Uh, I only talked about the cartier bit stack for ZP but there's a relative version of the cartier bit stack that makes sense. In particular, there's a cartier bit stack for Z mod P squared. And for, in the cartier bit stack for Z mod P squared, you still see this group scheme, uh, W star of F showing up as a stabilizer. So you can say all the same art words. And so, yeah, one thing that I should point out is that something that's still quite mysterious is that how does this uh, operator theta uh, act? So we know that it induces this FP grading, Z mod P grading, uh, but on each individual graded piece, you still have a residual nilpotent operator because I'm not saying that theta is acting semi-simply. 
Uh, and so it would be nice to have examples where this operator is actually non-zero because it's giving you some canonical extra structure on the Durham cohomology of varieties in PRCP with the lift to W2. Uh, but we don't have an example yet uh, where the operator is non-zero, except that, so you can prove that it's not always, like for, it cannot be functorially zero. So that's, that's the best I can do so far. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think this is all I wanted to say about the, the absolute prismatic story. I mean, there's a lot more to say. Uh, I could have talked about the Nygaard filtration and so on, but uh, I think for the purposes of this talk, this is all I want to say because I want to talk about F crystals. So maybe I can ask, are there any questions uh, about this, uh, what I've said so far? Uh, sorry, I, I have a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is there a version of uh, Cartier stack for uh, schemes over ZP or former mm -hmm. schemes over ZP? Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, and the definition is, I mean, somehow, once you understand the, the Cartier stack for ZP, it's not that hard to uh, do the general case. Uh, you just copy the definition that shows up in the prison structure. Mm -hmm. So let me not give it, but yeah, I think it's the obvious thing you might imagine. Okay, so in that case, so you can also define the cogitated locus, mm -hmm. then uh, that would be uh, an analog of theta, which would mm -hmm. interpolate the arithmetic sin operator and also the yeah. geometric Higgs operator somehow. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and you can describe the situation pretty nicely. So if you have a smooth scheme of uh, smooth scheme over ZP, um, mm -hmm. you get this Hodge-Tate stack for the smooth scheme it's fibered over the hot state stack for ZP. And then the fiber uh, looks like a gerb for the tangent bundle or rather the, a gerb for the PD completion of the tangent bundle uh, at the mm -hmm. origin. Uh, and then the gerb is trivialized exactly when you have some lifting data. So probably over ZP, it's always trivialized, but in general, it's, oh, okay, okay, okay. you need some lifting data. And that gives you the connection to Higgs fields as well. Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me talk about prismatic F crystals in my remaining time. So this part is joined in progress with Peter. And so this was an attempt, so pretty much soon after the prismatic side was invented, uh, we had this question of how does uh, this prismatic story relate to the usual notion of crystalline Galois representations? I mean, somehow the intuition is that the prismatic uh, picture gives you a good integral coefficient theory. Uh, and so you want to, uh, on, on the other hand, crystalline Galois representations are sort of Galois representations with good integral behavior. And so you expect that there's some interaction between them. Uh, and this is what we wanted to make precise. Um, and so here's what, we, here's what we got. So let me first give some general setup. So fix a p-adic formal scheme X. Uh, here, I'm not gonna assume smooth over ZP because in fact, the most interesting example is gonna be rings of integers of ramified extensions, potentially ramified extensions. Uh, here's a definition of a prismatic crystal. It's, uh, it's more or less what you might expect. So an F crystal on uh, X prism, O prism is the following two uh, pair of things. So it, you have a vector bundle on the prismatic side. Uh, so just a crystal of vector bundles. Uh, and then you have some F structure. So the condition you have is uh, that there's an isomorphism between the Frobenius pullback of the vector bundle and itself, but only after you invert the ideal of the prism. So it's this kind of a Stuka type condition. Um, and uh, I mean, the reason this is a reasonable notion is that if you're in a geometric setting, so if you have some Y over X uh, and you look at the relative uh, prismatic cohomology, then this is the structure that you get there. So if you're trying to abstract uh, from the gauss manin case, uh, this is kind of the natural notion uh, you would come up with. Uh, and so we wanted to understand uh, these objects better. And so here are some sort of two examples um, to keep in mind. So the first one uh, is uh, what I said. So actually, let me do the Tate twist first, and then I'll come back to the Gaussmannian example. So the Tate twist is, so this is something rather nice. Uh, so it turns out that uh, you can make sense of, the, of an infinite tensor product on the prismatic side. So O prism, uh, Tate Broikison or Tate twisted by one, I'm going to define to be the following infinite tensor product. So it's I prism tensor uh, phi pullback of I prism tensor phi squared pullback of I prism 
enter, and so on. So this naturally is a line bundle on the prismatic side of X. And so you have to do something to actually make sense of this. Uh, the implicit assertion I'm using over here is that the tail end over here, so each high enough for Bernoulli's pullback of I is trivial modulo a big power of I. So the tensor product, uh, and canonically trivial in fact. So the tensor product converges uh, to something reasonable. Um, and so this is, this is some object. And the reason to make this a, a definition is that you want, you want the structure, right? You want the Frobenius pullback of the vector bundle to be related to the vector bundle up to inverting the ideal. If you just took the ideal itself, then you would be trying to relate this guy and this guy. And there's basically no hope of doing that outside the crystalline case. Uh, but now you can do it. So you immediately sort of can see that at least if you believe that infinite tensor products behave like normal tensor products, uh, then what you see is that phi pullback of O prism of one is I prism of one tensor. Uh, well, it's I prism tensor O prism of one. And so what this tells you is that this bundle and this bundle are isomorphic to each other after you invert the ideal of the prism. So you get this F crystal structure. Um, and then there's also a gauss manin example, um, which this will be a special case of. So for Y to X. There is seem to be an inverse when you do the formal thing with infinite tensor product, you, it seems- Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Actually, let me not write the gauss manin example because I'm really struggling with time here. Uh, let me just, I, I said it in words and the connection with the Tate twist is that if you do H2 of the relative prismatic cohomology of uh, P1, uh, you'll get uh, O prism of minus one as one might expect. Um, okay, so these are F crystals. Uh, I was trying to make the point that these are kind of reasonable coefficient systems uh, on X. And so here's one way they're reasonable. So there is a construction which takes such an object and produces a local system on the generic fiber. So there's a natural functor which goes from uh, F crystals on X prism to, well, what I can do is I can consider F crystals on X prism again, but with a different structure sheet. So instead of using O prism, I can look at O prism, I can invert the ideal of the prism, and then I can periodically complete. So this is just the base change functor. I'm certainly allowed to talk about this, uh, but it turns out that this guy over here is equivalent to local systems on the generic fiber, ZB local systems. So this is a theorem. Um, and uh, I should say, so this work of uh, Zhiyu Wu, uh, which proves this theorem for X equals OK. Uh, but the theorem is true generally. Uh, and so you get this functor, which I'll call Tx, which is taking uh, an F crystal on X and producing a ZP local system on the generic fiber. So if X was uh, the spectrum of the ring of integers of a local field, uh, this is producing a Galois representation of the Galois group of the local field. And then I can at least formulate the theorem that we prove. Um, so say X is okay, spoof okay for k over qp finite. Uh, then the statement is that tx gives an equivalence between f crystals on x prism and uh, representations, zp representations of gk, so the local systems on the generic fiber, which are crystalline uh, in the sense of Fontaine. And so crystalline ZP representations can always be sort of spread out uh, to F crystals. And it's important to work with ZP over here uh, in the sense that uh, it won't be true if you sort of work mod P or anything like this. Um, okay, uh, and so this at least suggests that this category on the left is sort of a reasonable uh, integral theory of coefficient objects. Uh, it, it recovers uh, the nice ones that we know about uh, in the case of the ring of integers of a local field. Uh, obviously, I don't have time to give a proof of this theorem, which I wanted to, but let me just say uh, what goes into it. So the two ingredients. Um, so one is essentially it's uh, 
the work of Kissin, and then also which builds on ideas of Berger and results of Kidlaya. Um, and so the way to pr we prove this theorem is by taking an object on this side and building an F crystal. Uh, the way we build an F crystal is via descent. So if you go up to the ring of integers of OCP, uh, there uh, you have the corresponding prism, which is Fontaine's a inth. And there you can build a module uh, using ideas uh, of, uh, of these guys. So this is to build F crystal over OK, uh, over OC, sorry. Uh, and then we also need descent data. So we want to construct the F crystal by descent. We have some huge cover of my uh, faithfully flat cover of my final object and I built some object there. So I need isomorphisms over the overlap. And so the descent data comes from uh, the valence and fiber sequence. Sequence. So this is work of Antio, uh, Matthew, Moro and Nicholas. Um, and what it allows you to do is, uh, so this is over some really exotic looking objects. So it's the prism of OC tensor OC over OK. Uh, so we have this kind of really horrible looking ring and their theorem allows you to control some algebra over this ring. And then we use that to build the descent data that we need. Um, Okay, uh, I think this is all I can say. So I will, I will stop here. Thank you. Ask you the question. Yes, yes. Are there any questions? Yeah, but uh, maybe other people. Mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. In the computer, there are questions? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, so, yeah. so, uh, so uh, I seem to recall Drinfil was hoping to, Drinfil was was suggesting a way. I think he had to change the stacks a little bit of getting mm -hmm. uh, of getting coefficient systems on the stack to correspond to f gauges in the sense of Fontaine uh -huh. Janssen. Do you see that in this theory? Yeah. So so I should say that uh, Drinfil has these three stacks: sigma, sigma yeah. prime, and sigma double prime. And so what I talked yeah. about is sigma. Uh, now it's absolutely true that sigma is not quite good enough. Uh, so if you want a good coefficient theory that works not just with integral coefficients like ZP, but also accounts for mod P coefficients, uh, you want to work with uh, those finer objects. And so there, I mean, we have, we have a way of understanding his stacks, um, the fancier versions of the stacks as well, but it's, it's more complicated. But I absolutely agree that that's the right thing to look at uh, for a good integral theory. Okay, I was hoping it could be simplified, okay. Well, we get something slightly better so we can, Describe quasi-coherent sheaves on his stack without talking about this notion of admissible modules, uh, which I find quite mysterious in his work. Okay. Um, but yeah. Thank you. There, there is a question in the chat in the, I don't know, uh, I don't know if it is uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, just to, uh, just to clarify, act by minus i on the i means this eigenvalues minus i not as minus i identically i don't so what the, just to clarify x by minus i and gar i means with eigenvalues minus i not by minus i identically no 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 so it means minus i identically i have a complex ah, and theta good. equals minus i as an endomorphism of this complex uh, okay. um, and there was also a question in the chat about uh, under the equivalence of the last theorem is there a nice way to read off the hot state weight of the crystalline representation from the f crystal uh, the hush state weight just comes from the Sen operator, which is part of the definition of the just the yeah. crystal. So actually, implicitly, what this is saying is that if you want the hush state weight on this side, you can forget about the F structure. All you need is just the underlying crystal. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Oh, I think it's related to uh, it was question. It's uh, related to the Sen operator. So can can you say a few words about diffraction? Ah, thank you. So. Right, uh, Luke knows this. Uh, so Jacob and I have been calling this object uh, H prism of X restricted to the Hodge state locus, uh, the diffracted Hodge complex. So diffracted because it's kind of a slightly twisted version of Hodge cohomology. And it turns out to be an extremely kind of useful invariant uh, to understand the structure of prismatic cohomology. I gave you one example, which was uh, through Trintel's theorem. 
but also if you want to understand uh, things like the associated greater of the Nygaard filtration, uh, uh, the diffracted Hodge complex uh, is the way to go. So we have a fiber sequence, uh, for example, that understands GER I of the Nygaard filtration on absolute prismatic cohomology in terms of uh, the action of theta on the diffracted Hodge complex and its conjugate filtration. Um, and so this, for example, helps you understand. So there's a connection between this stuff I've talked about today and THH, topological Hochschild homology. Uh, and the statement that the fiber sequence I just made helps you understand the associated graded of, a, of the so-called mutivic filtration on THH. Where is the finer statement for some particular case? Or some particular well, the finer statement is, let me just, I can just write over here. So Ger I Nygaard of the prismatic cohomology of X, it sits in a triangle where in the middle you have a uh, fill I uh, conjugate of this diffracted Hodge complex. Uh, I can, oh, we, don't see any, uh, we can't read what you are writing. Uh, oh, you well, can't read what I'm... Uh, where are you writing? It's the red. It's the red thing. Ah, on the right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, I see, okay, 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 <laughs> sorry. Uh, now I see. Yeah, so uh, on this diffracted so Hodge complex. It's a fiber sequence? It's a fiber sequence, or it's a fiber yeah. sequence. So that helps ah. you understand this guy in terms of the conjugate filtration on diffracted Hodge cohomology and the action of theta plus I. Uh, so, for example, this recovers uh, Bokstedt's calculation of uh, the topological Hochschild homology of ZP, uh, but also some other examples. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, no, no preprint available yet. No what? Sorry. No preprint, uh, no manuscript available yet on these things. There's one on my Dropbox folder that I, I'm happy to send to you if you want, but it's not ready for public consumption yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, should I? Yeah. Uh, so I guess the other questions I see probably were answered, but I, I'm not. Uh, no, maybe don't close the question for me. Uh, like, is there a derived Frobenius slip on W card? Or oh, yeah, that? there is. Uh, I should have said that. All right. So, W card is naturally a delta stack. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is a question Would it be possible to prove the theorem for a general smooth periodic formal scheme over OK? Uh, I assume that refers to this theorem uh, over here, and I'm not sure because I don't know what the analog of the right side is uh, for a general smooth piano right. formal scheme. I mean, for yeah. OK, I know crystalline Galois representations, but I don't know what the relative, what a good relative notion of a crystalline Galois representation is. So I don't want to comment. Oh, okay. So uh, anyway, so uh, uh, so let us thank the speaker again. And, uh,